1985, yeah. after five <laughs> years of training and competing, I decided to open up, you know, open a gym. And my first gym was, we're still going now. It's bigger than now than it was when I had it. Body Works gym in Tottenham, yeah. North London. I'm always doing everything and I was cleaning, tidying up. I used to do inductions then as well because it wasn't, it wasn't like now. A lot of people know how to train. Then a lot of people didn't know how yeah. to train. There's never been in a gym. There wasn't that many gyms about. Welcome to another episode of Faster Podcast. And we're just outside of a very, very special gym, Muscle Works in Bethnal Green, with the man himself, Saf Kiriakou. For those of you who know, he's an absolute legend in the UK bodybuilding scene and even worldwide bodybuilding scene. Any bodybuilder that comes to this country has to come and check in with the Godfather. <laughs> That's why if you go to his gym, there's posters everywhere of the most famous and legendary bodybuilders in the world. So I'm going to start off with a little introduction from yourself, sir. And again, thank you so much for doing this. So how did you get into bodybuilding? Let's start with that. Um, in reality, I grew up in Cyprus and I came in this country when I was 14 years old. And I was born in 1960. So during the 60s, there was quite a few movies that were made with uh, Steve Reeves, which was a legendary bodybuilder, American bodybuilder of the 50s, 40s, 50s, and Reg Park, which they made the Hercules movies in, mainly they were done in Italy, okay? And they were dubbed and everything. So as a child growing up in Cyprus, um, we had uh, one cinema in the village. We had no television yet. So the only time that when the movies came to be played in the middle 60s, late 60s, 67, 68, those movies were, you know, a big influence in my thinking and in my way of looking at things. So from that minute onwards, I wanted to become a bodybuilder to build my body. But fortunately, you know, growing up um, in Cyprus, there was no any gyms, there was no bodybuilding about. Plus also, we didn't have the time. So in 74, during the war, when I escaped Cyprus and I came here by myself. <laughs> um, and then I went to school. I was working in a shop after school. There was a guy across the road from the gym that trained so i kept saying i'm going to go and train i want to train but i didn't get the chance due to my way my life was because i had to fend for myself i had to work go to school do my a levels so i didn't actually start training till i was 20. so quite late wow yeah well no, actually 1980 i started training the gym scene in, in England, London at the time was still very poor. So I started training in um, a sort of home gym that was given to a friend of mine to run with few people training. And that's when it started. By 1982, I started competing. The first competition I did was the, was the Naba Southeast um, Novice competition, which I placed fourth or fifth. Then I did the original Stars of Tomorrow, which at the time it was called um, EFBB. Then it became UK BFF, which was a, it became a big competition. The Stars of Tomorrow. It was just mainly for people that have never really competed and done. Well, in any, you know, they didn't get third. And then I got second in the middle world class. I didn't compete for three, four years. And then I did the, and then I moved to UK BFF. I did the Southeast in 91, middle way, I got second. Then in 92, I won the show. And I remember that show it was quite tough, but I didn't even get one comparison. 
I'm not Boston. I mean, it was. <laughs> so they just and, called you out straight for the first place. Yeah, because, and I didn't call for any comparisons. And I, I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm not going to place, you know? Yeah, because it's either you either lost and or you first. At the when time, it, it was at the time as well. They used to be, the show used to be split in two. So you had the, the, the morning show and then you had the evening show, which at the time they had a lot of pausing. Yeah. Okay. Um, then pausing was important because you used to get judged then. Yeah. Forget about the fact that you don't get judged. Routine. So you had to have your music, everything was done. So I'd done my music, choreography, everything. And it worked out really good. Then I competed maybe for another, done the British. Um, something happened in 96, 97, in one of the competitions. Um, and the UK BFF barred me from competing for a, a year. And then I thought, I'm not going to compete. So I went back home to Cyprus. I won the Cyprus competition twice. I qualified for the World Championships. But because I wasn't a resident, they didn't allow me to compete. But that's another story. And I have to go back in time a little bit because in 1985, I opened my first gym. That would have been my next question. Yeah. After five <laughs> years of training and competing, I decided to open my, you know, open a gym with all the savings I saved. I was lucky. I had a good bank manager. Um, I had a friend of mine that used to buy and sell secondhand equipment. That helped me a lot. And then that's when it started. And my first gym was, we're still going now. It's bigger than now than it was when I had it. Body Works Gym in Tottenham. Yeah, West London. I'm aware, yeah. I had that for mm -hmm. about three years. Then I sold it. I thought I'm going to go into other business because I sort of felt that I burned out from uh, <clears throat> working too many hours. I used to do everything. Wow. Just <clears throat> me and my wife, we used to do everything. Yeah. No, I didn't employ anybody else. And that's what I think not many people realize that you're you're still present at the gym pretty much every day and <clears throat> you run a very tight ship. And of course, dealing with so many people here with, you know, lots of testosterone pumping in the air. <laughs> I guess it's not an easy no, job. I, yeah, but I, 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 I learned because of my experience how to deal with situations and how to calm people down if there's a bit of a misunderstanding. Yeah. So, and people because, you know, they, they know that if they don't behave, I'm not going to allow them to come back into the gym. They have sort of respect me, so that helps to control the situation. Um, and they know that even if I'm not here, they'll be answerable to me. Of course. Um, especially now with cameras, it's easy to see what happened or what didn't happen. Yeah. You know? So that helps a lot. Uh, but the fact is that I was doing everything and I was cleaning, tidying up. I used to do inductions then as well because it wasn't it wasn't like now a lot of people know how to train then a lot of people didn't know how yeah. to train because I've never been in a gym there wasn't that many gyms about um I decided to sell the gym but I did something else for six months <laughs> and then I went back to the gym <laughs> and then when I opened Muscle Works when I came back originally it was in Bethlehem Green but um, Bethlehem Green Road in a smaller premises um which I still have now. Yeah, I still I just, remember that gym, yeah. And then I moved to the other, just off Bethany Green Road. We were there for 30 years. And then we moved wow. to, uh, we've been here about five years um, to the new premises. And I, I did that. I didn't really want to move from the old gym, but I needed more space. And also I couldn't change the hours because it was in a street that had houses and they wouldn't allow me to open 24, 24 hours. hours yeah. So I found these premises here, which is still Bethlehem Green. And because where it's situated, it's easier to, to get the license, which I did, to open 24-7. And that's how, you know, we, we are here now. That's such an <clears throat> incredible story. And obviously you lived a very interesting life so far with so many accolades and achievements. But I actually want to go back right to the beginning because I myself am an immigrant, but 
when I came here when I was 13 years old, I was blessed to come with family. And you said you arrived in London on your own. What pushed you to then go to this route to be so unique at the time, I guess? You said well, you've been training, when I, when you've been I, working hard. Yeah, the thing is, when I started, I was working uh, before school, after school. Uh, I tried, you know, I wanted to be educated because I was an um, embedded thing in my head, which is done back home. We, we, we look up, sort of, we, we brainwashed to think that the only way to get out of poverty or being in a bad situation is education, you know? So, but the problem I had was because I wasn't here illegally, but I wasn't really here. I wasn't a British citizen. So I couldn't, when I had my A levels, I wanted to go and do, I wanted to go to university, but I couldn't because I couldn't afford to, I had to pay for the university one thing, which I couldn't afford to. And I had to fend for myself as well you know, no family to, to help you. It, it wasn't easy. So I'm going to make you laugh in a minute, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so that desire to study and, and get a, go to university and get a degree or something pushed me to the fact that, uh, please, please, I don't want anybody laughing about this, but I'm <laughs> doing a history degree now at Open University. I've been doing it for about six months now. Wow. So I still have that desire for knowledge. And when you have a dream about something, you know, my dream is to become a bodybuilder, to achieve whatever I could achieve. When I realized genetically, I wasn't, it wasn't enough for me to become a big champion or a, a great champion because I didn't have the genetics. And because I understood how the body works, how, you know, it, I knew, you know, business and being in the gym was my next thing, but I still had that inner desire to get a degree in something, not for boasting reasons, but for personal satisfaction, you know? And that's why I'm doing it now, yeah. which is hard because I haven't got a lot of time and you need time to study, to write your essays, to do all that. Mm. Um, the good thing, I suppose, is doing it now is my English is a lot better yeah. than it would have been then. Because when I came here, I couldn't speak English. I had to do a lot of um, special English classes at school. Yeah. I had to miss a lot of other lessons for that. So it, it was a bit, but I still managed to do, get some A-levels to help me, hopefully, in life. Yeah. And knowledge sometimes people don't realize is it's a big thing because you don't know when that, you know, the expression knowledge is power. And, you know, it's not power, but you know what I mean? Yeah. The problem you have is, is that people don't realize that sometimes certain knowledge about anything could help you at one point or other of your life. And with me was the fact that when I was going to open my first gym, I had some money saved up, but I needed to borrow money. Well, in the 80s, it wasn't like it is now that everything is computerized. Then you went, you sat down with the bank manager and you spoke to them. They questioned you. You created a rapport. Maybe he liked you, maybe he didn't. And then that decision was up to the bank manager if you're going to get the loan or not. And the lucky thing I had was regarding what we said about knowledge is that he was from his name, this bank manager, okay? I realized that his name was of Armenian background, okay? And because I was interested in always in history and politics, I knew the news about Armenia, how it happened in, in this, I don't want to start using countries and things, but when they were in a certain country, there was a genocide against yeah. them. And they wanted the world to acknowledge the fact that that country created genocide against them. Okay. But nobody, you know, because of politics and during the Cold War with Soviet Union and yeah. all that in America, it was a bit different. It, it was, but then all of a sudden, because a lot of Armenians moved to, um, through Lebanon, they moved to France. 
over the, 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 you know, we're talking about 1920s and onwards now, okay? This happened in 1921. They, France, acknowledge the fact that there was, uh, against the Armenians, a genocide. So when I asked him, are you, are you Armenian? And he said, so because we had Armenians in Cyprus as well. Yeah. When they came over during that time. So I knew the names sort of, and he said, yeah, I'm Armenian, but background, my, both of my parents are Armenian, but I was born here. So I said, oh, did you hear that uh, last week, France uh, acknowledged the fact there was a genocide against your people in 1921? And he's only first country that has acknowledged this. Mm -hmm. He didn't even know this. Okay, he knew about the problem. Yeah, he knew the history, but he didn't even hear any news. And from that minute onwards, he took a re and we discussed politics a little of bit. Of course, yeah. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I was 25 years old then. In 1985, I was 25. He he, he sort of took a liking to me. So I managed to get the loan which probably I wouldn't have got because of that. And that sort of, he, he, he sort of reiterated the mm -hmm. fact that maybe he said a thing about knowledge. Sometimes it will help you in life. So learning anything about anything, sometimes it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And we should all embrace it and, and, and understand it more. And that helped me start my, my first gym. Of course. And, and if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for that law, maybe my whole life would have been a bit different, you know? So I do actually want to circle back to what you said, because you started by saying you're going to laugh at me, and then you said that you're going back into education. Yeah, but right. I think it's a very admirable thing, and it's a bit sad that, you know, we have as a society this preconception that it's only at a certain age you're allowed to push your education, you know, push your knowledge. And, you know, I, I know you met a lot of people that are, you know, my age, even, you know, I'm 26 or like 30s or 40s. They've kind of given up on improving themselves. They've given up on improving their knowledge. They've given up on improving their bodies. They've given up on improving their minds. And um, how, how old are you now, by the way? 63. So you're 63 years old and you're going back into education to pursue a dream that you've had way earlier on as a busy entrepreneur, as a businessman. What do you, where do you think that, that mindset comes from so for continuous improvement? What, what is your take on that and the people that say that, oh, at a certain age, you should kind of stop and settle down and, you know, don't, don't pursue your dreams, it's too late kind of thing? What's well, I mean, scientifically, keeping your mind active keeps you, your mind younger. That, that's a fact. Um, but for me, I suppose it could be the fact that I didn't have a good relationship with my father when I was growing up, um, I had an older brother. I've had, I have an older brother that's two and a half, three years older than me. And the way he was treated was completely different from the way I was treated. When the war happened in Cyprus, because he was over 16, he wasn't allowed to leave. But because I was under 16, I was allowed to escape. So, and because I think I had that thing in my head not to do everything right and correct maybe to prove to prove to my father that i was worthy more or whatever and that didn't just you know my behavior i never i made sure i didn't do anything that you could become addictive okay anything from smoking drinking taking drugs gambling I, I kept away from those things because I knew it's a disruption of life and it's a, a negative sort of activity to progress in life. And that helped me sort of stay strong and focus. Um, somebody gave me a book the other day and it was all to do about visualization, right? So I thought, let me read it just to see. And from the first 10 pages, I thought to myself, I don't need to read this book. This is what I've been doing all my life. Without even visualizing, reading. you know? I'm yeah. thinking, well, I thought everybody thought that way. Everybody sort of used that as, an, as a tool, you know? 
visualizing is a very good way of, but you must never ever, and I never did that, think too far ahead and too ambitious thoughts. You know, just keep it step by step. And so far, really, that's worked. I mean, I have some, you know, I have some regrets regarding my social media. I never got into it because maybe my age, I never found it. And I know people that if I'd done a lot more social media a lot earlier, I could have had a lot more followers. But that doesn't excite me. doesn't, you yeah. know, and now I see everybody filming themselves, training all the time, doing normal work. As I'm thinking, why are you filming? every worker that you're doing, which is more or less the same, you're not doing anything different or better or whatever. Why are you doing that? And that disturbs me a little bit, the way things are happening with social media. So let's, let's touch on that, actually. You trained in what, and competed, in what most would describe as sort of golden era of bodybuilding. Absolutely. Yeah. So the times of slim waist physiques that were not too bulky. You know, if you look at the likes of, like you said, Steve Reeves or Reg yeah, Park or Frank Zane, even a bit older on. They had very slender physiques, right? They weren't mass monsters like they are now. What do you see? And of course, you run one of the most competitive gyms to this day in the country. What have you seen over the years change in the styles of training? Let's go on a bit of a, of a lighter topic. In so, reality, the training hasn't really changed. Okay, let, let's take now, okay? In, during my progressive bodybuilding career, we hardly did any deadlifts unless you was doing powerlifting, okay? Because we realize deadlifting doesn't actually put on muscle, okay? It, it is not, um, it's too much of a compound exercise yeah. for a specific thing. And you didn't find that many people doing deadlifts, for example. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody's doing deadlifts because I don't know. Is it because of social media? Is it because of Instagram? Yeah. You know, and I try to explain to people, listen, you come in the gym, you tell me you want to get big and you go and waste a lot of energy and time and effort and risking your, your body really, yeah. because, it, you know, look, I studied biomechanics. Okay. About two and a half years ago, I took a, a sort of degree in biomechanics yeah. um, online and I did it and I passed easily because I understood things a you lot the better concept, yeah. because I've been witnessing it all, all my and even when I used to train I used to think this this is wrong what we're doing doesn't seem right you know yeah. it is it's... <laughs> look deadlifts for example started in a circus for exhibition reasons the same with the bench press it was called a floor press. I used to do it off the floor. But, and if somebody was bigger, they used to raise it by putting wood on the floor. And they'd press the weight from the floor. It was an exhibition thing. Yeah. In circuses, in, 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 in music halls, when they used to have the people used to go for entertainment. And people used to challenge people, oh, whoever can lift his weight can get $100. Or, you know, it started in America. Yeah. <clears throat> and then he, he moved to Europe. If the one bodybuilding exercises, but we learn how to do them. You know, I don't want to get in too much into all that now, but because that would take hours to discuss. But it seems to be a trend that has no benefit to somebody that wants to build muscle. For so, example, yeah. just, just the exercise alone. But now everybody's doing it. So that changed. The, 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 the other thing that changed more as we progress in bodybuilding, because more people were doing it, you'll find more people with genetics that were much superior. So you had a bigger pool of people to choose from yeah. to create the freakiest Champions, physique. Yeah. Okay, so people didn't really change their training that much over the period of say 20 years. Yeah. But what changed was, is that more people were doing it. Yeah. So instead of only getting one person from Austria, Arnold for example, yeah. 
and another person from America or from Cuba, Sergio Oliva, for example, oh, great you'll have, well, to me, Sergio Oliva had the best physique on yeah, the planet. Incredibly aesthetic. Even, oh. Yeah, he was okay, complete. He was complete. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> because you had more people, then you'll have more freakiest physique coming up. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it, it does come down to genetics. Who is going to be yeah. a champion or who's going to be just a good competitor, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that's what changed things up to mm -hmm. a point. Then I would say chemicals came in a bit more. People were, were less scared to use more. Because I think well, they were using that amount and they improved some. I, I you took a bit, take more yeah. than, you know, and that helped. But that brought the bodybuilding as we knew it to a bit of a stagnate. It yeah. stagnated okay. to a point that people didn't look at it as, oh my God, look at that physique. They look, people that are more into bodybuilding, for example, they look at it and say, oh, it's full of steroids, it's full of chemicals. And you don't want, when somebody looks at a physique, you don't want that first thought to be about steroids that are coming into somebody's head. And that's what was happening. Yeah. And then bodybuilding starts changing a little bit. And because of social media, we had all these other classes in competition coming up, yeah. which created a much more population training to improve their bodies and, mm -hmm. you know, build mm -hmm. muscle, whatever. Yeah. But now they realize that that look, that freakier look, doesn't appeal to the general public. Yeah. Which it doesn't. You know, imagine, say, your mum yeah. or your grandmother looking at that physique on the cover of a magazine and saying, oh, look, this is ugly. Yeah. Am I wrong? That's, <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. But it's better when your grandmother looks at a body on the cover and he says, oh, it's got a nice physique because it doesn't yeah. look... And that helps the sport, actually. Yeah. And that helps more people it to do it. it. And it helps the whole business of bodybuilding yeah. to, to improve. You mentioned something that <clears throat> I personally have been having a bit of a problem with lately, which is drug use and how it's being addressed right now. Because I know that back in the day, even the biggest IFBB pros that were running the most stuff, they were very, uh, let's just say, they, they weren't as open about the use. Either they were saying that they were lying that they're not taking it or they were sort of avoiding the questions. Whereas now, I think it's almost becoming a popular thing. I don't know if you noticed on social media and in all these YouTube videos of guys, you know, 19 years old, 20 years old, you know, 25 years old, basically saying how great steroids are, how amazing it is for them to run Tren, which is obviously one of the more dangerous compounds. Well, you, know what then, call it, you know what they call it in America? They used to call it the tre Trembolon. Organ Wrecker. Organ, imagine, wrecker, and meaning damaging, you know, they, they use the word wreck as in yeah. smashing your car up, for example. Y yeah. And, and that's what it was. Yeah. Because he is that damaging. And he doesn't just do that, it does other things as well, you know, with your libido and yeah. other things. So, so I see. Or acting levels, you know, it, it is a problem. But I think because you have a small a, a group now that's still not a very large group that still want to be freaky looking mass monsters yeah you know but i think the other group of people that they look at the physique as more of a a display of a, a much more acceptable look is a bit more in the scene that's why you had the classic physique you have you know we didn't have classic physique then then, you know, somebody saw my pictures on the wall. He said, oh, you must have won a lot of classic physics. Look at your vacuum, how good it is. Yeah. said, in my day, there wasn't such a thing. It was just bodybuilding just and nothing body. else. <laughs> nothing else. You know, you, you either, you know. Yeah, because I, like I said, I think it sets a dangerous precedent. Because even me, I've been training for about 10 years. I went through all the stages. I went through my powerlifting stage. You know, I went through the stage where I wanted to be as big as possible. And now I've kind of reached a point where I want to look, be healthy, first of all carry a healthy weight and have an well, aesthetic look, right? Well, this is this is part of the reason why I wanted to learn more about, about biomechanics and exercise because I realized that because everybody was training wrong and we are training wrong still, a lot of people and do a lot of wrong exercises, 
the fact is that you have to do a lot more volume, okay, to create that stimulation for the muscle to grow. The problem you have is with over doing exercise, doing too many exercises, there's still you're still utilizing your nervous system above what you should be doing and you don't get recovery. So the only way you can recover is by using more steroids. So the steroids, in reality, they've stopped the innovation of exercise and bodybuilding the more, the better way. Because steroids will correct the wrongdoings yeah. And they will allow you to still progress because of the steroids, even if you're still training wrong. Even if you make a mistake. They help you, you know, the, you end up doing more volume. That means you train each muscle less frequently. If you train each muscle less frequently, in reality, if you are not on steroids, the muscle would probably start shrinking and going back to its normal level if you don't train it again with a specific amount of time. But how can you, when you're doing so many sets and exercises, for each body part, so you haven't got enough time. Yeah. So most people end up doing everything once a week. Mm -hmm. But scientifically, it's been proven that after four days, maybe five, the muscle will start going back to where it was. Yeah. But if you're on steroids, that doesn't happen. The atrophization point doesn't begin to happen after four or five days. It takes longer. So you carry on doing everything wrong. Two things happen. Your muscles don't shrink and your muscles grow and recover because of the steroids. So how would you advise if someone is committed to training naturally, how would you structure that kind of training? Would you go? Well, with... you know, if I, if I went in the gym now and I said, okay, I know for a fact that bench press is not the best exercise for building chest because of its very simple way of looking at it scientifically. This is physics. This is not my opinion. This is not my idea. It's physics. To create more stimuli in the, chest, in the pectoral muscles, you have to move the insertion of the muscle to the origin. And that goes for every muscle, like for your bicep, for your triceps, everything. So essentially stretch and then well, contract. Yeah, you have to contract fully and you have to stretch fully in a nice controlled manner. And the other thing that everybody should learn, and this is what we should have learned from the first day we go to the gym, if you want to build muscle, not if you're Olympic weightlifting, or powerlifting or anything else, you do not allow other forces to help you lift the weight apart from the muscle you're training alone. So the biggest thing that everybody does is creates momentum. Momentum takes away from the muscle being used. But you come to the gym and train because you want your muscles to grow. So to grow them, you have to use them more. Yeah. Well, why are you doing those movements so fast? Why are you jerking the weight? Why, you know? And, and I, I know the reason because I went back in time and I looked at where bodybuilding came from, how it started, the history of it. I went and bought magazines going back to the 30s and 40s, American and English magazines. And I looked at, I see if I didn't know anything about bodybuilding to see are going back to the history. Because always history teaches us what, why, where, where we are now. Okay, the, it explains the reason. And history says that, and I looked it up and it, it confirms this, that every bodybuilding champion up to the late 50s came from an Olympic weightlifting background. Even Arnold went I to the Olympic weightlifting yeah. class, which means the first gym they went to, the first, there was no bodybuilding, there was only weightlifting gyms. Yeah. Okay? Is Olympic weightlifting, which the only common thing we have with Olympic weightlifting as a bodybuilder is the bar and the weight. We have no <laughs> other <been> common <laughs> because everything they do has to be explosive, has to utilize outside forces to move the weight, which is momentum. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with building muscle. It's got nothing. They don't care about that. Yeah. Okay. Course. And this is what happened. But they all went to do weightlifting and then they decided, oh, weightlifting doesn't build a lot of muscle, which yeah. it doesn't, apart maybe from the legs for the amount of squats they have to yeah. do. 
and front squats. Yeah. So, oh, let's take a bodybuilding. So when they started performing the so-called bodybuilding exercise, which they assume were bodybuilding exercises yeah. anyway, but they were, they were better exercises to build muscle, they were still performed in an explosive manner. Yeah. And that's why we do what we do now, because that's what we've been taught. That's what we've, we've been sh shown because nobody really understood or sat down and analyzed our sport. Even when you watch Arnold train today, you see him moving the weights on a machine or free weights I get in a, in a fast momentum way y using... Yeah, he's quite known for that, okay, that well, style of training. You know, imagine, you know, when people say about Arnold done a lot for bodybuilding, actually, and no disrespect to Arnold, okay, it's not his fault. He, he, he made bodybuilding worse by doing and promoting even his book today. I've got his book. It was given to me. I probably got four uh, uh, Arnold's Bodybuilding uh, Encyclopedia, whatever it's called, okay? People give it to me as president over the years. When you read a lot of stuff there, it's not correct. But people today, they still read that. Yeah. I don't want to insult Arnold, so I apologize to Arnold. He's not, you know. But it, it, that's what... And we carry on doing those wrong things. It is, it's not. And as I said again, I, this is not my opinion. It's so to do with physics. And physics is to do with angles and direction of resistance. Okay? Which is there. We know on every body part, on our bodies, which way the muscle fibers go. Yeah. We have different types of muscle fibers. Where the insertion is, where the origin is. We know that. We can see it. We can go on a computer now and look at the muscles. You know, we can see, you know, the most complicated muscle on the body, you know, before chest is your traps. You have the muscle fibers going that way. And at, at the top, you have them going that way at the bottom. And for each side, you need slightly different exercise to, to train it. The rear delts. You know, a, a lot of the machines that are done, they're done wrong because they assume that's what people want. The people that make the machines are not making them as correctly yeah. as possible. They started doing it, but it's not yeah. what it should be. And that's what, um, because if you get that right, then going back to the steroid situation and to the chemicals, yeah. If people are progressing easier and better, they will not rely on the steroids to help them progress. Yeah. And course. this is why I feel so passionate about it, really. And I try to teach people, but it's not easy. You know, sometimes it's easier to change somebody's religion than it is to change the way they train. Yeah. <laughs> there's one thing I think that makes your gym unique, especially in this day and age where there's gyms around every corner, and I think that's what keeps it back, and it's the atmosphere. And only in one other episode um, of a podcast you did, you spoke about what I would call the first ever influencer marketing example that I've heard about in the gyms, where you said you would let professional bodybuilders train at your gym for free, who are competing. To, no, not to, professional, to, to draw just people and, in. And, and originally, I, I actually paid a professional bodybuilder. Uh, his name was Brian Buchanan. When I first opened uh, Bodyworks Gym in Tottenham in uh, 85, I actually offered him to come and train and I pay him. And the only thing he said, he didn't even ask me, he's such a lovely guy. He didn't even ask me how much. He just said, I have to come first and have a look if I like the gym. Yeah. Okay. And he came and he liked the gym, so he stayed and then we became friends. But what I used to do is somebody competed and won his competition, any, anything from novice to juniors to seniors to anything, I will give him a free membership. And that's what I did. That's, that's, very, you know, that's very interesting. Because I wanted to create that atmosphere that the original Gold's Gym had in Venice. I'm talking about the original one, the one that um, Pampinayon was filmed. For yeah, example. the one that wasn't next to the Venice. beach like it is now. Yeah, yeah, it, was no, no, no. it was a yeah. lot, it was smaller. You know, and when I first made Bodyworks, this is what I, I did it on that black equipment. Uh, everything looked the same. 
I even uh, imported flat weights for the dumbbells because then you couldn't get them anywhere. You know, weights like the the, the normal uh, five kilos, two and a half. With the plates rather than that, the it, one, it was one cast pla- iron. Well, dumbbell. yeah, it, yeah. Or no, before you used to get all the weights you used to get in this country were they had a shape to them and they had a name and right and and, and they used to be quite thick. But if you're going to have a, a 100, 120, 130 pound dumbbell, it was too long. It was too big. But when you yeah, use the, the, the five uh, pound weights, five kilo weights, which was 10 pounds, they were flatter. So you could put quite a double the amount and it was still the size won't be that big. And I think it's that attention to detail, right? That makes the yeah, gym I so mean, unique. Yeah, I mean, I imported them I, and I tried to get the best deal. I said, don't paint them. I'll paint them myself. And I remember me and my wife <laughs> just painting yourself. them. Yeah. It's, it's actually a thing that I've noticed. I came here to train with my brother. And I'm not even joking. I'm not putting this on for a podcast. One of the machines has a plate on it that says made in West Germany. <laughs> yeah, he, I had children. Some of the equipment is yeah, like Yeah, because it, it, it was uh, gym 80 machines, okay? Yeah. And um, I had two, three of them before. Now I've only got one left because, and part of the reason why I changed the others is because the plates were breaking. I couldn't get the right plates. I couldn't get parts for it. But it was made in, you know, Cold War years before the Berlin War came down. And he still, I mean, Jim A.T. equipment is very good and I I still have later ones. But it had, yeah, made in East Germany. That's insane. What would you say after all these years, after literally decades in the business, what do you say is the most challenging part about operating a high level gym like this? It's keeping the customers happy. Because just because they're customers or because they're members, you know, it's certain things that I don't tolerate and people know this. I can't tolerate people leaving weights and dumbbells on the floor, okay? or abusing the equipment in a way that, you know, I try to be nice, I try to say, please, don't drop the stack like this. It's cast iron plates, the crack, you know, they cost money to replace. I try and keep the prices of the membership down. I haven't increased my prices for 20 years. Wow. You know, so... That's insane. Sorry. That's right. Um, you know, I've given more and more and more to customers, but as long as we're busy and we're making money, I'm thinking, just let's just keep it. Let's not, because I remember when I first started training, I didn't have a lot of money and I, I was finding it hard to pay my membership, you know, in Tower Gym and Triangle Gym. I, I think and, that's what you know? makes And place. that, yeah, yeah, just so try and get, as, as, you know, as long yeah. as we're making a profit, a good profit, why, you know, I still spend money on equipment. I still change things around as we progress, try and give, even machines that I don't use myself, but I think they could be better or I could, you know, give something a better feel for a movement. If I find something that I think, oh, that's better, then I change it. Even if I don't, I don't use that machine. And it's quite a few machines that I don't use at all because I don't think biomechanically they're correct. But you know, I still make sure that. So you always put in the customer first. You put in the yeah, people, do, the yeah. trainer first yeah. because... And you're right, I think, because for a lot of these guys, it's it's their workshop, right? It's where they come to build their bodies. And like you said, they make a living you know, from people, their bodies. Well, it's not just people so making a living. People, people leave, leave work. They're so obsessed with training. Instead of going home and relaxing and maybe then coming out to gym or see their family, they come straight to the gym to train because it's part of... And I remember being that way. I remember how it feels. So you try and make it you know, as as good as I can. So that's for the challenges. But now on a more positive note, what is the best thing about owning a gym like this? To be truthful, I get a lot of compliments from people that are visiting London or they just come to London um, from America, from Canada, from Australia, from all over the world. You know, usually those countries have good gyms and they say, Oh, I couldn't wait, you know, I can't wait to come back because I really like the way the gym is. It's not like back home anymore. It's so changed. If you're into serious training, I think you look at things from a different perspective. It's like going to a, 
you know, we all visit restaurants. We all go to restaurants, okay? You know, when you go to a restaurant, it doesn't matter how pretty or how it looks. As long as the food is good and it's clean, you prefer to go there than go somewhere that might look pretty, might be all nice and 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 and, and gleam, gleaming and uh, shiny, but the food is not very good. Then you don't really want to go back. Of course. You know, you might want to take your girlfriend and impress her, but in reality, when it comes to eating, and that's why you go to a restaurant is to eat, then the same with this. I look at it, it's, you know, I mean, people will call it atmosphere, people, which is it's hard to explain. You know, I don't see it that way because I'm here all the time, but when people are repeatedly telling you, then you think, oh, I must be doing something right. Because it is true, and I think your disciplined approach, and like you said, you run a tight ship, it translates into the environment in the gym. Like, it doesn't matter, like you said here, if you're a professional mass monster, you know, huge guy, or if you're someone who's just training to keep themselves healthy, I see that everyone here treats each other with respect. Yes, and if, if I find people don't do that, then I'd, I'd so get let's, them to So let's live. talk about that. I've, I've heard you, even myself, when I was training here, I heard you get on a, on a intercom, <laughs> on a speaker, and announce to everyone that's saying, my name is not an idiot, my name is Sav. And if you don't put the weights back, you're treating yeah. me like an idiot. So how do you keep that discipline in here? Of course, there's a lot of guys here that are scary, yeah. massive guys. How do you deal with that conflict resolution if someone is being disrespectful? Because like you said, you have people skills. When you're applying from a loan, you use your people skills. It's almost like politics in its most raw form. No, I want know? people to, first of all, I, what you see is what you get. I want people to realize that that upsets me. That and and because people know that I am right in what I'm saying. I'm not asking for something that doesn't make sense, that's beyond the understanding of somebody or I'm doing it for reasons of whatever, you know? I'm doing it in reality, most of the time, is for their own safety as well. Of course. And also, if you're looking for a dumbbell and you can't find it because it's not been put on a rug and it's everywhere, who, who loses out? The, the people that are training lose out. So you, you always find exceptions. So you find out of 100 people, five people that really have no understanding of that, they spoil it for everybody else. So when I'm having a go and I'm, sometimes I swear, is the people that are guilty, they know who they are. Yeah. The people that are innocent, they know. They haven't done anything wrong. They don't worry about it. And, you know, if sometimes I'm a little bit heavy when it comes to... See, what upsets me the most is when I said to someone, listen, I've just looked at the cameras, you left a pair of dumbbells on the floor, please go and put them away. No, it wasn't me. My, I didn't <laughs> You're lying to your face. I said, listen, <laughs> and then I get angry. Yeah, of course. Because, you know, and I say, well, I could lie, you could lie, everybody could lie, but the thing is, my eyes cannot lie. Yeah. What I've just witnessed, yeah. and then I don't want to go back and show them on the cameras, oh, look, it's you. You know, if people done it and they said, oh, sorry, so I'm going to do it, then I haven't got a problem. And they're not repeat offenders, obviously. If you're repeating the same thing to everybody, then you think that's disrespectful. And that, I think people know what, you know, if you, if I was doing something for no reason, just because it's my gym, I do what I want. Yeah. You know? And I, I, I tell people, don't blow your own horn. Don't blow your own uh, trumpet. If you're a good bodybuilder, people, let people come and tell you. Don't boast. Yeah. You know, I remember I had a friend, a Greek guy, that we were training together when I had body works. And I don't want to mention names or anything. And he was a Greek guy, okay? And, he said, and I remember him, yeah, I walked on stage like a Greek god. I said, you don't say that. If people tell you, you look like a Greek god, then that's they thank you. It's a compliment. But don't say, I walked on stage like a Greek god because you won the competition. You know, that doesn't sound good. People laugh behind your back. And then 10 years after that, he came and thanked me for, for trying to put him right. And then it took him 10 years to realize his behavior was no good. But So you sound like a man with serious but fair principles, right? You mentioned respect, you mentioned humility, you mentioned not boasting until you sort of deserve the crown and things like that. What are some... I mean, I'll tell you the truth. When you were saying, uh, let's have the legend and all that, I feel embarrassed when you're saying all that. 
when you started your thing. It embarrasses me. I'm not, when, when you know, not I'm not be, saying you're, you're that's a, not fair. Maybe, yeah, yeah, it's fair, but it's, I still feel <clears throat> embarrassed, which is, yeah. you know, I can't help the way I feel. I'm well, not saying you, what you said yeah. was wrong. Yeah. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't say anything wrong. I just, I'm just telling you how I feel. I feel a bit embarrassed and that's the way I am. That's, that's interesting. But what I was going to ask is that day to day, are there some things that you've been doing ever since you started lifting or you do now that, that help you? So I know you mentioned visualization. Yeah. You're always visualizing the next step. Do you do anything else every day, like part of your daily routine that helps you stay in such a shape, help mentally, physically and spiritually, I would even say? I mean, people is going about meditation and this and that, okay? To me, my medita meditation time is the time I'm training. When I'm training, to me, I don't care if it's music on. I, I, actually, I'd, I'd rather not have any music, but that's besides the point. I had uh, my best workouts really during um, COVID when I was training when the gym was shut and I would just come and train by myself, like with no music, no, you know, all I wanted to hear was the noise of the, of the machine or the, the weights or my breathing. That is, to me, that's meditation. That helps me. Um, and I do, um, you know, I remember when I had the other gym as well in Enfield and I was running from that gym to here and to the other gym in Stoke Newington and I was feeling tired. And I remember saying, you know, like in my head, you know, just do this. This is not going to beat you. And I'd be thinking about other people that had to struggle. People that live on the street and they have no, nowhere to sleep. You know, I would think of those things and I'm thinking, come on, I'm in the car, it's warm, I'm comfortable. I can stop and get food if I'm hungry. You know, what about the people, you know, and I remember a little bit the time when I was growing up and I had no, not a lot of food. I remember I'd be eating Weetabix with milk and bread and cheese for my meals yeah. because I had no, I had, didn't have a lot of money. So, so just yeah. gratitude in general. Yeah, and, 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 and that helps you get motivated to do better. I mean, at the moment, okay, I'd, the gym is really busy, I'm making money, it's, it's okay, I don't need to. But the fact that I could maybe get next door building to add another seven, 8,000 square feet to the gym and make the gym even better, to me, it's as exciting as going into a toy shop as a, a little boy and buy a little matchbox car. To me, it's as exciting as that. There's always the next goal. Yeah, it's always and something it's, to, you know, to it's, strive it's, towards. It's not, nothing to do with money. It, you know, it's quite an expensive deal. I might, at the end, make less money than I'm making now by doing that, but I'm not looking at, looking at it that way. I'm looking at the fact that I will make the gym better and come near it because I still don't have the gym of my dreams because I, I think I, I will never be able to have it because if I have something better, I'm going to look for something better because that's the way I am. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's maybe it's hard to explain. I'm not sure, but no, that, that makes total sense to me. You're always striving <clears throat> for like the next goal. Yeah, and it's nothing to do with financial. You know, I didn't, you know, I had money to do some business and I could have done another gym, but it, was, it wouldn't have been a challenge as much. So I went and did some other business that I've never done before, and it was a bigger challenge. Yeah. Which I've never done, you know, that, that business. But I did it just because I wanted to be challenged, you know, mentally in a way, not, yeah. not physically as such, but mentally. That makes total sense. So having, again, been in the gym business for such a long time, <clears throat> one thing I see a lot is people scared to sign up to a gym they're scared to go to the gym they 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 think it's intimidating they think it's not a friendly environment because they've never been to the gym so the only things they see is like you said these guys in the posters that look like they could eat a human being yeah. alive <laughs> but we both know that they're normally the nicer guys so what would you say to someone who who's too afraid to take that first step you know and and start that healthier lifestyle well the the first thing i would say is that you you should try and 
understand one thing, that those people did not go to the gym looking that way. Everybody started from ground zero, from nowhere, from nothing. <clears throat> yes, obviously, genetically, some people look better than others, even when they start. But, and also the people that you, you meet in the gym, because they've all started or they've all done what you're doing, they understand. And it's much easier. I mean, we don't have the problem here because, uh, you know, because most of the people, well, 99.9% .9 of the people that come here, they've already trained somewhere else or they know what to train. But I remember when I first had the business, it was when you, you know, sort of bodybuilding and gym shop, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, it wasn't as it is now. <clears throat> and I remember when I had time, I would say to him, don't worry, when you come in, I'll come with you and I'll train with you. I'll help you out when I wasn't as busy or whatever. And I knew if somebody had a, a bit of a problem and he was a bit shy or whatever. And I said, don't worry, I'll come and train with you. Wow. And I would train with them, so-called training, yeah. just to make them feel comfortable because I needed the business. And I also knew how they were feeling and, and it, it wasn't a nice feeling. And that will help. And, you know, that, that did help. Now we don't have that because everybody that comes to Muscleworks, they know what it's all about. It's not, it, we still get it. People that are still training or coming from other gyms, they still feel a bit intimidated. So I make sure that I, when I'm at the desk and I have my staff, I make sure that they get them in and speak to them a bit more, explain to them a bit more, show them a bit more to get, feel them more comfortable. So it will make it easier for them. And we're a business, you know, and, and it's one thing I've got to say is, okay, I'll tell my staff, as long as the other person is not rude with you, it doesn't have to be polite to you. As long as it's not impolite, to understand, it doesn't have to be, as long as it's not rude, if he doesn't say please or thank you, because I had staff that got upset that the person is not saying please or thank you. I said, you have to understand, not everybody has the same upbringing as you. They don't, they, they, as long as, they, if they're rude to you though, yeah. you're allowed to be rude back. Yeah. But if they're not rude to you, just because they haven't been polite, it doesn't mean they're not, they're rude, just because they're not, they're not polite. As long as they're not rude, then you just, you, you still say please, you still say thank you. If they don't want to say that to you, they don't say that to you. And, but what happens is, those people, once you do it a few times, they learn to be pleased and thank you and goodbye. Other people walking in, they can't even say hello. They look down. So those people, I try to make them feel more welcome. I try to learn their names. I try yeah. to say, hello, John. All right, are you all right today? You know, or when they're leaving, to try and make them feel. Because sometimes people are shy. They, they're introverts, you know. Yeah. They, they don't, not everybody's the same. They don't want to be rude, I think. It's just they, they're too shy to look at you in the, in, in the eyes, to, to feel a bit intimate. I don't know. But then if you do things right and change things overall with most people, it's not going to happen with everybody. It helps the whole environment, you know? That's, that's interesting that you mentioned <laughs> sort of looking at it from their perspective and not judging them straight away and saying no. this person is rude. There's one question I wanted to ask you. You obviously lived a life full of different achievements, different mm -hmm. adventures. What advice would you give to your 20 year old self if you could sit him down in this car right now and just have a conversation? What advice would you give him having lived this life so far? Get as much education as you can get. Even if you're doing personal training, try and learn more. Any, anything that you're doing, you don't have to go school or university or whatever to learn. And learning now is much easier. You can Google things out. You can find things out as they are in real life. You, you know, we didn't have that. If you wanted to learn something more, you had to go to a library or whatever, you know, or find the right book to read. Now it's so much easier to learn about things. We should all know more, you know, about everything, even about politics. You know, somebody was complaining the other day about politicians. And I said, well, have you ever voted? He said, no, I will never vote. I said, well, you have the right to vote, 
That's why we live in a democracy, which is a Greek word, which means the people hold the power. If you don't vote, you can't open your mouth and say anything about anything about politics or about politicians. This is how you do it. And then he turned around and said to me, yeah, you're right. You know, because it's simple. We, you know, we know. No, everything is perfect, no politician. But at least, we, and, and, and learning more will help everything. It'll help you bring your own children up. You know, that's why there's a lot of this dysfunctional society in a lot of areas. Because it's parents that are not good enough to be parents. They have children because they've been brought up a bit wrong. The children they bring up are wrong. And then it carries on. But we still have our own, especially at 20 years old, we know what's right and what's wrong. We can learn and understand things in a better way instead of sitting at home smoking a spliff and chilling out. You can do those things in a different way. You know, I don't want to chastise anybody because they smoke marijuana or whatever, but, you know... If you look at science, it said the motivating product. You know, it, it, it demotivates you from doing something else. So how do you expect to get motivated to do anything when you're taking something that demotivates you? And that's why I never ever wanted to do and will never do. <laughs> and finally, one thing I'd love to end on and we're reaching that time now is you still, you know, you spoke about the new gym and expanding it. Perhaps, where do you see yourself in ten years' time? Because you seem like a man that's on a forward trajectory. <laughs> you don't stop growing. You gain an education. So, where do you see yourself in ten years? To be truthful with you, I want to create more knowledge regarding training and trying to get as many people to train more correctly so they don't get injured as much and they progress a lot easier, which means they, they don't have to rely on chemicals to improve, you know, and that really, you know, is, I feel very passionate about because I didn't have that when I first started training. You know, I had people that didn't really know what they were teaching me and they were teaching me things to do and that's wrong, you know, you. And to me, that's what I want to, I want to be able to convince people to change for the better. Not because it's my opinion, because it's a fact. And logically, you know, God or the universe dictates that, you know? So to leave, leave a positive legacy. I think that's an incredible point to end on. And I'll be honest, Sav, I could sit here for six hours. And I, could, to you and I could talk for you so many things. There are so many stories about. that we possibly can't fit in an hour, but I know how busy you are as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Like you said, Sav is involved on a day-to-day -day basis. He's always here. And that's why I think this gym is so incredibly unique. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. Thank you so much for the knowledge, for the stories. I've learned so much. My mind's absolutely blown. <laughs> and... Once again, thank you. Thank I really, you. really appreciate thank it. Thank you for giving me the Best chance. Best of luck to you. And to thank you guys too. for watching. Goodbye.